this morning we have two readings that we're going to look at. The first is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, which says, But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in flesh. And then from Ephesians chapter 1, 1 through 4, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the, Lord, to, the, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Um, we'll end it there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this week we're starting a new sermon series that, that I kind of had fun with putting this together uh, here this past week. We're, we're calling it Sacred Selfies. We all know what a selfie is, right? A selfie is when we take a picture of ourselves, usually on a phone, a smartphone or something like that. Uh, we take a picture of ourselves. Now, um, I guess a, a selfie, usually a selfie shows not just us, but something in the background so that we can see what somebody's doing or where they are or who they're with. Usually people take selfies to, to say something about themselves, not just a picture of themselves. Um, usually the background of the picture is just as important as the picture. Uh, so a selfie is a picture of a person taken by that person that usually shows what they're doing or who they're with or where they are. Uh, if we look at people's selfies, we kind of get a glimpse into their life. We kind of get a glimpse as to who they're spending time with, where they are, what they're doing, a little bit anyway. We can piece together all of their selfies and get an idea who they hang out with, where they like to go, what they like to do, at least to, to some extent, a tiny little glimpse. When we take a selfie and put it out there for others to see, we're kind of giving people a glimpse into our life at, at who we are and what we like to do. Um, there, there's one of me up here on, that's me working on the sermon. And you can't see the screen, but you'd see only one paragraph. On there, So that was very, very early in the sermon prep. Uh, I asked for people to send in pictures, and uh, Sue Cross sent in this picture of her and her car with a little, if you look, you can just see her dog on the right side of the picture. Um, and then there's a, a picture of, of me and Shelly. Shelly's working on the bulletin there. Um, so just little glimpses into our lives that, that tell us just a little bit about who we are. Um, the, the problem with selfies is that it's just surface stuff, isn't it? it? It might show who we are at a really shallow level, at a really basic shallow level. Uh, but who we really are remains hidden. Well, the purpose of this series is to kind of take a look at who we really are. Uh, not just what a selfie might show us, but who we are deep down inside, beneath the surface. And I hope that, that we'll discover in the following weeks that that as a, follower of, and as a follower and friend of Jesus Christ, that, that our identity comes from Christ. And, and our identity can be revealed through Christ better than in any selfie we might take. Later in the series, we'll be looking at, at some self-examination uh, to look at, at how our identity informs our relationships with others, informs our spiritual growth, our desires, and ultimately, um, what type of selfies we might project to the rest of the world. Now, that first verse we read is a really important one as we get started. That kind of forms the foundation for the entire series. And I want to suggest that we do that as, as a memory verse this week. Try to memorize that verse. It read, He who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. We're going to talk a lot about unity, and, and that verse really kind of sums up the unity that we have in Christ. He who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. 
So if we've got that relationship with Jesus, if we, if we really do believe in him and we trust in him for our salvation, uh, then we are one with him in spirit. We're united with him in spirit. I, I've heard somebody say that they don't like that word unity because it implies that we're all the same. And, and we're not all the same. We know that, right? God created each one of us uniquely, differently. We're all specially equipped to do what he's called us to do in the ministry of the word. Um, but that talk of unity kind of implies, at least to that one person, that we're all the same. But that's not really what it's all about. We are all different. We're all unique. Thank God, I was thinking, thank God nobody in this room is just like me. We'd all be in trouble. We've all got different personalities. We've got different hobbies. We've got different likes and different dislikes. We're all different. We're all unique in God. Uh, you're good at some things that I'm not good at. I might be good at a couple things that you're not good at. Uh, but we're all different. But spiritually, if you're a true believer, you're united with Christ in spirit. Uh, your spirit and Christ's spirit are as one. That's what it means when Paul wrote, he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Now, our spirit defines who we are. Uh, it kind of defines what our core values are, what we think is important in life and what we think is not so important in life. Those deep down desires that we have, our spirit shapes those. Uh, our values, our worldviews, how we see the world and how we see others in the world are kind of shaped or formed by our inner spirit. And that spirit, if you're a believer, that spirit that shapes our worldviews, that spirit and Jesus' spirit are as one when we're believers. He who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Now as we look at, at that idea of of, of Jesus Christ being our identity, of, of identifying ourselves with Jesus Christ. Let's kind of understand what that means. What, what, our, what is our identity? Webster's Dictionary defines identity as the distinguishing character or personality of an individual. The, the distinguishing character or personality of an individual. So if we're identified with someone, we would have, at least some of, to some extent, we would share character and personality traits with that person. So if our identity is in Christ, at least to some extent, our character traits, our personality traits will be somewhat similar to Jesus' character and personality traits, at least to some extent. And as we grow in Christ, as we grow in faith, that should become more and more uniform with Christ's. That's, that's what it kind of means in our mission statement when we say that we want to live by Christ, live like Christ. Uh, we get our identity with Christ. So as we try to live like him, we begin to become more like him. At least our personality and our character traits become very similar to his character and personality traits. Um, I have facial recognition on my phone. Um, I, I got one of those newer iPhones that has the facial recognition and I can look at my phone, and it will recognize who I am, and it will unlock because it, it knows who I am. Um, it looks at my face, and it recognizes me, so it unlocks. Uh, if it doesn't recognize me, it doesn't unlock. Sometimes we'll be sitting on the couch, and Sarah won't have her phone with her right there, and she'll grab my phone to look something up, and it won't unlock for her. So she holds it in front of my face and then it unlocks and then she can do what she wants to do. But, but it knows who I am and it unlocks for me. Uh, it won't unlock for anybody else. It won't recognize anybody else, so it won't unlock. It's, I, I like to say sarcastically that, yeah, it's a smartphone. Um, the idea is that if, we're, if our identity is in Christ then people should be able to recognize us because they see Christ in us. They see the character and personalities of Jesus in us. When they see us loving others and serving others, they see Christ in us. They recognize Jesus in us. 
Let's look at our, our passage in Ephesians to see what we might get from that that, that speaks to this. I see three things in it that I wanted to bring out further. And the first I'm going to spend a lot of time on because it builds on that unity that we were talking about. We're going to talk a lot more about unity. Uh, that passage, if you remember when we read that, said a lot about being in Christ. And he's talking about that unity with Christ. Then, then he makes some very special promises that are conditional. And I want to look at that. And then we'll look at what those promises and blessings really are. But first, getting into that unity, um, it talked a lot about being in Christ. The first verse he's writing the letter to the saints, uh, in yeah, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Um, if you're a believer, you're in Christ. You're kind of united to Him, and that's how Paul is saying that you're in Christ. Um, and a little side note here, he says to the saints in Ephesus, uh, in, in the Bible, when you see the word saint, he's just referring to a believer. Uh, the Catholic Church has this whole, they have to vote whether or not you're a saint. And you have to have performed miracles, you have to have raised somebody from the dead, uh, all of this to, to be considered a saint. Uh, but the Bible simply says if you have faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, um, then, then you are in Christ and you are a saint. There's nothing really mysterious about being a saint. Folks, you're all saints. In the eyes of God, you're a saint. Uh, if you believe and follow Jesus Christ as your Lord, you're a saint. Uh, anyway, back to that little phrase, in Christ. We see it two more times outside of that introduction just in our reading, and then we see it a few more times. If you continue through, the actual paragraph goes through verse 10. You see it at least two more times. Um, in verse 2, it says that we're blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. What a promise that is, right? Every spiritual blessing. That should be last, kind of sum up in case I missed everything. You get every spiritual blessing um, if you're in Christ. Verse 3, he chose us in him. He chose us to believe in him, to be in him, to be united with him. Verse 6 talks about God's victorious grace, which he has freely given in the one he loves, in Christ. And verse 7, in him, in Christ, we have redemption. Um, so unity with Christ, being in Christ, is really important. It's, it's important that we understand that. And it was really important for the Ephesians, because this talk of unity in Christ is the foundation for the rest of his letter. If they didn't grasp the unity that they have with Christ, they'd never understand what he's going to get into a little bit later. Um, that idea of understanding our unity with Christ, our being in Christ, is really important for us to understand our faith. Uh, it's really important to, uh, to our faith. Later on in Ephesians, in chapter 4, verse 3, he writes, um, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And we already saw that unity of the Spirit means believing in Jesus, being kind of united in Jesus. And here we see that that's lived out in peace, in peace with one another. We live at peace with our brothers and sisters in the church. The church is the body of Christ. Uh, Paul continues to build on this. And in chapter 4, verse 11, he starts talking about, um, we'll read it here, it was he, talking about God, he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Why did he do that? To prepare God's people for works of service. Why did he do that? Why was service important? So that the body of Christ, which is the church, may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure and fullness of God. That's a really full passage. There's a lot there. I'll try to break it down a little bit. God gives people different roles in the church. He, he said, some are apostles. Now, if I, I looked up the word apostles, it means ardent believers or sometimes missionaries. He, he calls some to be prophets. A prophet is somebody who hears from God. Some to be evangelists. An evangelist is someone who shares the good news. 
uh, and some to be pastors and teachers, some to be prophets, one who hears from God. All these different roles, uh, different people, are to work together to build up the people for works of service. We talked a lot about service last week and the importance of service, reaching out to others and serving one another. Um, And the works of service, when we all work together doing things, it builds up the church so that we can reach unity in faith and knowledge of Jesus and maturity in the fullness of Christ. Unity is a big part of that. The whole thing falls apart without unity. If we're not united with one another, it falls apart. We work together as a church family doing works of service. Those works of service bring us closer together as as the body of Christ, which brings us closer together as Jesus, being in Christ, which... Where'd it go? (laughs) Which builds us up in maturity and fullness in Christ, I guess is where I was going with that. Uh, But does that make a little bit of sense? Sometimes in in the book of Romans especially, Paul talks very, very complicated. And this is one of those passages in Ephesians. Most of the book is easy to understand. But this is one of those passages that's just got a lot into it. We kind of have to break it down to understand what he's telling us. Bottom line, we've got to be united with one another and united with Jesus in the Spirit so that we can be mature believers attaining the fullness of Christ. I think it was C.S. Lewis, and I got to questioning that this morning, maybe it was J.L. Packer, but I think it was Lewis who said that a hundred pianos all tuned to the same pitchfork are all tuned to, one, to each other. We as believers, we can have a hundred different believers all tuned in with Christ, they're all tuned into one another. Um, We're all united in spirit with one another. Um, The second thing I wanted to talk about, those promises are are, uh, conditional promises. In verses 2 through 10, Paul gives us a lot of of blessings and promises um, that we all have because we're in Christ, in Jesus. Um, They're great blessings. They're great promises but they're conditional promises. They're not available to everybody. You don't get just because you're born. They're not universal promises. They're conditional on your being in Christ. If we're united with Christ in spirit, we get those promises. Those blessings will come. Now, the Holman New Christian uh, commentary uh, has a little introduction to the book of Ephesians, and I I thought that was really good. I I wanted to share that, and it's kind of long here, but it says, do I have that on there? Yeah. Ephesians 1 helps us to see who we truly are as Christians. Of course, more influences our inconsistent behavior than just negative imprinting. We are members of a fallen race encumbered with the internal power uh, of sin. So we still struggle with that sinfulness that's inside of us. But as believers, we learn to control that. Um, Still, if we could see ourselves more clearly and more consistently as who we really are in Christ we would be able to live more consistently like him. That's why the Bible spends spends so much time telling us who we really are. If we understand and believe it, we will better be able to live it. So Paul tells the Ephesians who who they have become in Christ, and then he prays that they might have the spiritual enlightenment to to grasp who they have become, to really understand who they have become. To do so is to enjoy the Christian life more completely and to live like Christ more consistently. Paul started his letter telling us that we were saints, united in Christ. If we could all believe that and and begin to live like that, then then we'd do a much better job walking a a life of faith, wouldn't we? Um, What are those promises that he gives? What are those blessings that we can expect um, We're promised every spiritual blessing in verse 3. We're promised holiness and blamelessness in verse 4. We're promised to be adopted as sons in verse 5. And don't feel left out if you're a a woman. 
if you're a lady, because adopted as son means something legally. In that day, ladies didn't get part of the inheritance. God made that provision that even then, that, that you know, we talk a lot about equal rights and equal pay and women's rights and all that kind of stuff now. They wrote about it 2,000 years ago. In Christ, you have that true equality. And that even if you're a lady, you're adopted as a son by legal standing, you get part of the inheritance. That's what that means. We're promised God's glorious grace in verse 6. We're promised redemption and forgiveness in verse 7. We're promised that part of the inheritance in verse 14. The seal of the Spirit in verse 13. Um, these are all incredible promises. And, and every one of them will be yours in Christ when you're united with Christ in spirit when you truly believe in Jesus Christ so what does it mean to believe in Jesus Christ does it mean to believe that he existed 2,000 years ago that he lived and died 2,000 years ago you can probably get a sense from all that we receive if we believe in him that that's probably not enough to just believe that much um there's probably something a little bit more. Uh, Ron Hutchcraft talks about this. When he was a little boy of, of 10 or 12 years old, he wanted to act like a big boy and all his other friends were going out to the ocean and he went out with them. Uh, but he couldn't swim. He'd never learned how to swim. Well, they went out into the water and he went out into the water telling himself that as long as he can stand up, he'll be fine. Well, they kept going out deeper and deeper and they were up this high in the water. And, and somehow a wave pulled him out a little bit just to where he couldn't reach. And he started to go under. And, and he said he thought he was going to die until a lifeguard reached out for him. And, and he said that when he was going down for the last time, he said that arm went down into the water from the surfboard that the lifeguard was on and, and grabbed a hold of his arm. And he said he grabbed onto that arm with all he was worth because he knew he was going to die without it. That's what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. Um, if you're drowning in the ocean, believing that a lifeguard existed 2,000 years ago isn't going to help you at all. If he's not there with you right then, grabbing a hold of your arm, you're going to die. So to believe in Jesus Christ is to grab onto his arm with everything you're worth, knowing that you're lost without it. Um, We were at one time all drowning in our sins. If you haven't grabbed a hold of Jesus like that, like a drowning man grabs the arm of a lifeguard, then maybe you're still drowning. Maybe you still need saving. If that's you this morning, I encourage you to, to reach out to Jesus Christ. He's extending his arm to you this morning. Grab his hand and hold on to him with everything you're worth. Now, we're not going to have an invitation because we're coming up to the table here in a few minutes, but, but let me know after services uh, if that's you this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this writing of Paul's that, that stresses the importance of, of our unity in Jesus Christ, strengthens the importance of our being one in spirit with Christ, Father God, we pray that that may shape our identity. That we may, as we live for Christ, take on his personality and character traits. That we may truly be identified with him, united with him in spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.